So good to declare that truth in this place. We have a savior, Jesus, who has taken our sin and our shame and has given us his best. Amen. Amen. We talk a lot about the kingdom of God in our services, and it's not just a past ideal. The kingdom of God is not a future hope alone. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is now. Jesus prayed that may your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is not a location. It's not a destination. It's a community of believers surrounding around the truth of who Jesus is and stopping at nothing to make his name famous in our everyday lives. It's you, it's me, it's us. Collectively choosing to live outside of these walls what it is that we sing in this place. That the kingdom of God would be here as it is in heaven. We wanna sing a new song and declare that truth today. It goes like this. Here and now, your kingdom lives. Here and now, in our midst. Here and now, your kingdom lives. Yeah.
for you. Let's hide the name of Jesus, church. Come on. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever do. We live for you. be afraid. Do not be discouraged because the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Reminding us that if we trust in him, he will sustain us. Whether you're in this room or watching from home, thank you so much for singing along. Go ahead and have a seat. Worthy, 
The word we just sang over and over again in that song is, you know, it's not a word that we use a lot just in our everyday conversational language, but when it comes to the language of our faith, it's such an important word. It's such a rich word, first and foremost, because we have a God who is worthy of everything. He's worthy of our life. He's worthy of our worship. But on the flip side of that is the truth that we are completely unworthy to approach him. Have you ever been in a situation where you've just felt completely out of place, unworthy? I have many times in my life. One time I remember in particular was when I was a sophomore in high school. We were in the state championship game of our basketball of our basketball season. Uh, we were playing against this team that was the three-time defending state champs. This was in, in Kansas. And uh, the reason, mostly, they were the three-time defending state champs is because they had a senior on their team, a guy named J.C. Holloway, who was the state player of the year multiple years. He was gonna go play at Iowa State the next year. In college, he would be an all Big 12 conference player. He was a stud. He lit us up that night. One particular moment I remember from that game though is I had the basketball and I was passing to a teammate. Well, he intercepted the pass and that that situation turned into a one-on-one him against me. I ran all the way back, all the way to defend my goal at the other end of the court. And uh, as I got back there, I just just stood my ground and I braced myself to try to take a to take a charge with him coming full steam at me. Right as he approached me and right at that as that moment of collision, I like turned my head, closed my eyes. But instead of feeling that contact, there was nothing. So I in an instant, I just pop my eyes back open to see what was happening. And all I see, this is all I remember, like over 25 years later, is the bottom of his shoes. <laughs> like going right by my head. Like, how is that humanly possible? He was, he was an amazing athlete. And in that moment, like I knew, like I had no business being on the same basketball court as that cat. I was unworthy. It's that same attitude, realization that that I have no business being in the presence of God, unworthiness, that's at the very foundation of our faith. Yet, yet what we celebrate in communion every single week as we eat bread and juice that represent Christ's death and resurrection, it's through those actions that he took all of us who are completely unworthy. And there's nothing we could do to make ourselves worthy but he alone made us worthy for one reason, because he wants us for whatever reason to be in his presence, both now and for all of eternity. So as we celebrate communion, for those of you that are new with us, we invite all followers of Christ to participate with us in this, in this time. We'll share more instructions on our screens. For those of you watching online, join us in this time as well. Father God, we approach you in these moments in a full state of confession saying, God, we're, we aren't worthy. But thank you. Thank you for making us worthy through the blood of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I want to welcome those of you that are new with us this weekend at CCV. My name is Dave. I'm the campus pastor here at our Peoria campus. After the service is over, if you haven't had a chance yet, swing by our new to CCV area right out here in the courtyard. As uh, we'd love the opportunity to meet you here, story, we have a free gift, a gift for you there as well. For those of you watching online for the first time, comment in the chat section as we'd love to connect with you. Now, there's a couple of things happening here at the Pure Campus this week that I want to make sure you're aware of so that you can take advantage of them. The first is beginning this week, we're offering a five-week version of Financial Peace University. Two great things about this class. One, for those of you parents, we have childcare available. And secondly, FPU is entirely free for you. Take advantage of that great opportunity. The second thing happening this week only is on Wednesday night, uh, we are offering our Jumpstart class. Now, how many of you remember having the talk with your mom or dad? You remember this? I remember it when I was 12 years old and it's been well over 30 years and I'm still horrified about that conversation that happened. What I love about Jumpstart is it helps create a great foundation for those conversations to play, take place with your kids. It's designed for kids in fourth and sixth grade for you parents to come with them. Again, you can find out more information about both of those events, Jumpstart and FPU, uh, on our webpage or uh, through our CCV mobile app. We are also just about a month away from Easter weekend. We're really excited about celebrating Easter. Uh, here's the thing I'd encourage you, start praying for the people you have in your life who are far from God, who would, you would love to, to bring with you to an Easter service. Uh, we're, in a couple of weeks, we're gonna transition to a series leading up to Easter uh, called Welcome Home based on the parable Jesus told about the, the prodigal son because we all have a tendency to go our own way but the true thing about our God is that we have a God who's waiting to welcome us home. It's gonna be a powerful season and we look forward uh, to celebrating that with you. Right now though, we're gonna start a two week series called Ambush. I wanna pull, I invite you to pull up your message notes on your CCV mobile app as we'll be hearing from our senior pastor today, Ashley Wooldridge. It is so good to be with everyone. You know, I, I've had a couple interviews recently, which have been, you know, great, but I've really missed just being here and preaching God's word, and I'm really excited about today's message. Um, before I get into it, I want to give you a quick update on More Than Us. More Than Us was an initiative we launched back in 2019, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to raise some money, not for us, but to invest in other churches across the valley to help them grow, and so... 5,098 households, you, gave over $6 million, and 100% of that is given away to help churches reach more people for Jesus all around us. And uh, it's fairly been incredible what God's done. We sent out an email a couple weeks ago. If you didn't get that, let me just give you a quick update. We've helped 29 churches across 26 zip codes the funding we've done has funded six new church buildings, five new buildings for kids. All in all, get this, we've helped with construction for 244,000 square feet of space that's all being used so more people find Jesus. We even helped a church in South, uh, that was a meeting in a school, secure a property we purchased for over a million dollars to gift to a church, an all Hispanic church in South Phoenix. And God is doing miracles through more than us, so thank you very much. Here's, here's, here's the convicting thing for me. When we launched More Than Us in 2019, we had no idea what 2020 would hold. And many churches have told us without the More Than Us funding that helped with our audio, visual equipment and cameras, we don't think we would have made it through 2020. So CCV, I just wanna look you in the eyes and say, thank you, thank you for being a generous church that's all about churches all around you. Thanks again for that, yeah. Well, this weekend, I... I was sitting at my desk getting ready to write the message and I got a little overwhelmed because I thought this topic is so big and so relevant, where do I even start? 
And so what I wanna start with is I decided, I'm just gonna start by telling you how I got the title for this series, Ambushed. What happened was a few years back, I was reading the book of Proverbs, which I, which I do quite frequently. It's a book on wisdom written mostly by the wisest man who's ever lived, Solomon, to his son to teach him how to avoid some of the pitfalls and downfalls of life that, that will destroy you. And when I was reading chapter one, one verse jumped off the screen at me. I mean, just hit me like a ton of bricks. And what it is, is it's Solomon telling his son, there's something people do where they ambush themselves. And we're thinking, why would you ambush yourself? Well, remember, an ambush by very nature is something you don't see coming. So here's what Solomon says, chapter one, starting in verse 17. He says this, if a bird sees a trap being set, it knows to stay away, which we're like, duh. If you saw the trap, you'd never go into it. Verse 18, but these people set an ambush for themselves. They're trying to get themselves killed. Now watch this. No one else set the ambush. They set the ambush for themselves. They did something that they didn't know would absolutely destroy their life. And we're thinking, what is it? Here's what Solomon says. Such is the fate. Such is the path of all those who are greedy for money. It robs them of life. What happens is if you have this thing in your life that you always need more, what happens is the word robs is the word choke. Literally means to grab, hold, and choke. And the word life is literally your neck or how you get breath. And so Solomon says, if you have this thing in your life where you let greed take over, it will suck and choke the very breath from your life and destroy you. Anybody else feel breathless? That's what greed does. Now here's the problem, I think. No one, no one admits they're greedy. Is that, is that fair? I mean, I'll just give you an example and you raise your hand if this is you. Raise your hand if you'd say this. I'm a really greedy person. You know, it's like, we, you're not gonna raise your hand for that, right? I mean, there's very few of us that would do that. I mean, that'd be the equivalent of some of you guys admitting that you watch The Bachelor at home alone without your wife. Right? That'd be the equivalent of some of you ladies going like, you know, when no, when everyone's in bed, I get up and do TikTok videos by myself to try to keep up with my kids, right? I mean, it's just embarrassing. We don't want to admit that we're greedy. We would say something like this. Sometimes I just want a little more, just a little more. What's interesting is that all throughout the New Testament, the word used for, more, or for greed by Jesus and Paul and many others is a compound Greek word that can literally be translated. I want to show you the translation. You ready? Here's the, the word, for, 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 word for greed. Wanting more-ishness. You ever been there? Yeah. You ever wanted a little more-ishness? I mean, most of us have been there, right? I mean, you ever, you ever been in a place where you said, you know what? I, I want more even when what I have is sufficient, technically. Or how about this? I want an upgrade even when what you have still works. What I'm gonna say next, <laughs> some of you will not believe. It's gonna sound crazy to you. Some of you are old enough to remember this, but some of you are gonna have to go back to the history books and like do a little, little history lesson for yourself. But in, in, back in the day in America, and this is gonna sound crazy, I know it sounds crazy. Back in the day in America, people used to buy things and use them until they broke. I mean, that's cra it's crazy. You're thinking like, why would someone do that? That's so stupid. Why would you use something until it broke when you can get something nicer and better all the time? And this is gonna sound even crazier, okay? When something broke, do you know what people did? No, they didn't throw it away. They actually fixed it. You're like, that's so dumb. When something breaks, that's your chance to upgrade. I'll just, I'll, I'll just be really transparent. I was writing this and I was thinking, I've done this so many times. In fact, um, this was years ago. I had an, a little bit older generation iPhone and you know, like all of us, it's like, man, there's the new one out, you know? And so I actually dropped my older generation iPhone and I cracked the screen. It wasn't on purpose, okay? Here's the funny thing. I wasn't mad. Because why? 
I was like, this is my shot. You know, so I, I, remember, I remember this like it was yesterday. I went to Jamie and I showed her, the, my, I was like, look what I did. I acted all like defeated. Look what I did to my iPhone. I cracked the screen. And she looked back at me and like this, she just has such a sweet demeanor about her. And she's like, oh, honey. She's like, I'm like, I got to get a new one. She goes, no, you don't. You just take it down. They, they have those places that fix your screens for you. I'm, I'm like, no, I can't fix that. I got to get a new one. And she looks back at me with this like, beautiful, beautiful brown eyes she has. So beautiful. And she just gets this little, little like quirky smile and she's like, and that's when I went and fixed my screen. All right. So it's like, <laughs> but haven't you, I mean, haven't you been there? Like you just wanted an upgrade. You wanted more. I mean, it, 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 it's like, there's this thing inside of us that you're like, man, I, I just kind of need the new, I need the new car. I mean, they have, they have, air conditioned seats now that come up. I mean, I need that. Or, you know, we got to get some different furniture. I mean, our house is looking so 1990s, right? I mean, it's 1990s or our house is looking so 2020s. You know, we're a year behind now, you know, or Hey, forget the furniture. We got to get a new place. We'd just be so much happier. We'd be so much happier if we just got a new place. Or if we just made a little more, we could take better vacations and that would help solve a lot of the issues we have relationally, marriage-wise, with the kids. Like, we just need more. If we were honest, if we were honest, most of us would admit that most of life, most of our life is a constant pursuit of more. And what Solomon is telling us in crystal clear terms is that if that is your lifelong pursuit, you will ambush yourself and destroy yourself. That's what's on the line. And so today, we're gonna learn about a four letter word, contentment. We have to, I mean, it's like, yeah, who wants to talk about that? We have to learn to be content because it is the antidote to an ambush life of destruction when all you want is more. So I'm gonna give you the bottom line of the message today, and then we're gonna unpack it, okay? The bottom line, if you fall asleep or you're watching online and you know, the power cuts out or whatever, so here's the bottom line, all right? Contentment is a place you, isn't a place you arrive in the future, it's an attitude you embrace today. Let me say it again, contentment, is not a place that you arrive in the future. It's an attitude that you embrace today. But to embrace the attitude of contentment, I think we need to dig deep, and this is gonna be uncomfortable, to look at where does this thing, this nasty thing inside all of us, this desire for more, this wanting more-ishness, where does it come from? And I hope you're taking notes today. We're gonna dig deep, all right? Here's, we're gonna start really easy, okay? Greed is driven by discontentment. Just the idea that what I have today is not enough. You're like, duh. But here's the thing, not all discontentment's bad. I mean, you can be discontent with the world today and wanna to make it better, that's awesome. You can be discontent with your marriage and want it to be better, and that can drive you to go to counseling, and that's a really good thing. You can be discontent with your organization or your business today and really want to make it better and drive better results and that benefits all your employees or everyone that you, you, you work around, that's good. Solomon's saying the discontentment when it comes to your stuff and money is an ambush that will absolutely choke you to where you can't even breathe, you'll destroy your life. That's what he's saying. So if you're discontent, if there's all sorts of discontentment inside you today, I think you have to answer this question. Here's the question. What do you need in order to have enough? Literally, what would you need to finally get to a place where you're like, you know what? This is enough. Did you know researchers have studied this over the years? They've asked thousands and thousands of people this question. And do you know the answer is almost always the same? And here's what's crazy. The answer is always the same regardless of income level, square footage, or how much is in your bank account. What's the answer to how much you'd need to have enough? What is it? A little bit more. That's the answer across the board. Across the board. 
It doesn't matter if you make $50,000 a year or $1.5 million a year. The answer is always across every research study, I just need a little bit more. Even John D. Rockefeller, one of the top three richest men in the history of the world, when he was asked, John, how much money is enough? He so famously answered this, just a little more. So what we have to admit, what we have to admit, if that's all the research, and you think you're different, I get it. You think if I get to this income level, it'd be good for me. And yet you're gonna like, you know, be different than every other person in history. What you have to admit is this, is that discontentment is an insatiable appetite. It is an appetite. Listen, it's an appetite. And we think, well, if I starve the appetite, it goes away. When you starve your stomach, does your appetite go away? No. If greed is an appetite, if discontentment is an appetite, listen, the more you feed it, the more it grows. So what are you going to do? You're just going to say, well, I'll I'll never buy anything for the rest of my life for the history of mankind. Think that's gonna help you? I mean, it gets all rid of all of it? Well, maybe not. We have to do something different. We have to see where it comes from. But it's an insatiable appetite, and you know this. Let me give you a couple examples. And you know, don't raise your hand, but do a little gut check. How many of you have said this when buying a house? This is gonna be our forever house. <laughs> I've said that. And then all of a sudden, isn't it so interesting that that forever house, the discontentment builds? How many of you have bought a vehicle and said, I'm gonna drive this one in the ground? Nervous laughter. We've been there because it's so easy. You thought it was gonna be all nice and shiny and then it just wore off. How many of you had an amount in your mind that if you ever made that amount, you said, I would be set, I'd be completely content. And then you made that amount and you were not content. It's an insatiable appetite. So if greed is driven by discontentment, where's discontentment come from? Watch this. Watch this. This is big. We've got to dig deep. Discontentment is fueled by comparison. You compare your life and what you have to everyone else around you, and your awareness, your awareness fuels your discontentment. Um, When I was, uh, after I graduated Bible college, I actually went and got my MBA and I'll never forget sitting in one of my business classes and we were doing this case study and it just struck me, it was so fascinating. What they did is they studied this company, it was a banana um, company that was opening a manufacturing facility in a remote part of Central America and what they did is they were going into this remote part of Central America, all the workers like lived in huts, had nothing and so the the income they had to, you know, wages they had to to pay them was really, really low, that was what was a to them. So they opened up the factory, got all the workers hired. The workers came in the first week, worked the whole week. They paid them their first paycheck and something happened they did not expect. Almost every single worker quit that day. They got the paycheck. Why? They never had that much money in their life. What would they do with all that? So now, they're, now the, the company you know, has a crisis. We have no more workers. What should we do? One of the leaders got a brilliant idea. He started shipping shopping catalogs to the village where, all the, where they all lived. And miraculously, in one week, all the workers came back to work. What happened? Their awareness and their comparison of all the things people had around them that they didn't have drove a level of discontentment that they didn't even know existed inside of them. And you, you hear a story like that, and when I first, first heard it, I thought, it almost sounds dishonest, doesn't it? Almost sounds like there's something wrong that that company would do that to them. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, could you imagine a world where companies today with you knew a little bit of something you didn't have, they thought you should have, and they started marketing to you things that you didn't even know you needed? I mean, that would be crazy. Could you imagine if like ads on your social media for things you didn't even know you needed showed up? And then every single time you purchase something, this would be really weird. Every time you purchase something, they said, well, you might also like. Because customers who bought this product also bought. And all of a sudden you're aware of everything that everyone around you does, has that, that you don't have. But you already knew all that anyways because you're on social media. And what does social media do? Social media already makes you more aware than ever about what everyone around you has that you don't have. So what is it? Comparison fuels the discontentment inside of you. And comparison is a never-ending no 
win game. So if greed's driven by discontentment and discontentment's fueled by comparison, what does comparison do? Let's keep digging. Comparison creates insecurities. It makes you insecure that maybe all the people around you that have something that you don't have, maybe that's the reason they're happy and their life looks better than yours. Maybe that's the reason their marriage is great is because they have more stuff than you. They make more money than you. Maybe their kids are more well-behaved because they just have the vehicle where they can spread out more and your kids have to sit next to each other and hit each other. (laughs) I mean, it's just, it drives insecurities in us like crazy. But watch this, and this is the hard part, okay? So I'm just giving you the heads up. If greed is driven by discontentment, discontentment fuels comparison, and comparison creates insecurities, where do our real insecurities come from? This is the root of all of our wanting more. This is the root, watch this. Insecurities are born from a false identity. Your greed, your wanting more-ishness is really an issue with your identity. And you have begun to buy into the lie that who you are and your value and worth is dictated by what you have and what you look like, not who God says you are. And do you understand how dangerous this is? This is why it's, this is why it's an ambush, because we don't like to get to this level. We stay up here, we're just like, yeah, I want a little more. You don't even realize that the issue is actually an issue with your identity. And the reason this is so dangerous is that many of us are so unhappy here today and it's because we placed our identity in what we drive, where we live, what we wear, a projection of success. And when this happens, listen, when this happens, your identity will never be secure. It will never be secure. Why? Because there will always be someone that has richer, nicer, better, prettier, fancier, newer than you. And so your identity is always shaken. It's always shaken. And you walk around and you feel anxious all the time. You feel depressed. You don't know what it is. You keep striving. So you keep buying. And what you don't understand is that you've bought into the lie. You've bought into the lie that who you are is dictated by what you have or what you make. Since when did our society get to dictate to us that who we are is what we have? That's an American version of Christianity, not a biblical one. And we've bought into it in our country specifically, and we wonder why we have more in America than we've ever had in our history, and yet we're more unhappy than we've ever been. It's all about our identity. And into this world of shakenness and discontentment, Jesus speaks. Because Jesus always speaks to our greatest needs. And in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, he's speaking some warnings around his disciples and the people that were around him. And Jesus says this about greed. He says, then he said to them, watch out. Why would Jesus say watch out? Because it's an ambush. You won't even see it coming. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. There's all sorts of greed. There's greed with money, with stuff, with your house, with your car, with your clothes, with your image. Your Life. The word life is the word Zoe. It's the life you really want purpose, peace, joy. Your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. Why have we bought into the lie? Your life, your identity has nothing to do with what you have. And until you embrace this, until you embrace this, you will never have contentment and peace in your life. The Apostle Paul takes the words of Jesus and he speaks the same thing. Listen to how he puts it. Writing to his protege Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter six, Paul says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, all of us are looking for like great gain in our life. We know that godliness is required. Paul says, no, 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 no. You've got to have contentment with godliness or you'll never have a good life. Contentment? Yeah, that's the key. And then he goes on to remind us, like, why? He says, listen, for we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. 
Anybody else have parents that used to tell you, I brought you in this world, I could take you out. <laughs> I'm not gonna say whether I've ever said that to my kids, all right? But that's not what Paul's saying. What Paul's saying is this. You came into this world butt naked, you will leave empty handed, and you better learn to be content in between or you will be destroyed. And then he just destroys our American version of Christianity. He destroys it. He says next, but if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Now that's nobody's life verse, right? You've never met someone and go, what's your life verse? Oh, if I have food and clothing, I'll be content. No, what do we want? We're like, no, if I have Whole Foods and Lulu, I'll be content, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what brings contentment. He just destroys it. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. You are enough with what God's given you right now. You're enough and you can be content with that. And then he tells us what's on the line if we don't learn to do that. He says, those who want to get rich, who are in this constant striving for more, 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 I just gotta have more. They fall into temptation and a trap. Remember, it's an ambush you won't see coming. You think you're just being driven. You think you're gonna give your kids what they always needed. You think you're gonna improve your marriage and your life. It's an ambush, it's a trap. And many people, into many foolish and harmful desires, this takes people. What do they do? They pl it plunges people into ruin and destruction. Look at the word plunge. Plunge is like you're walking along, you didn't even see it coming, you fall off a cliff. You didn't see it coming. He goes on. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Not, not money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money are more and more and more all the time, have wandered from the faith and they've pierced themselves with many griefs. And you know this. You see people in your life that they've been destroyed by the pursuit of money. And yet we don't like to look inwardly about how we might be driven by the same thing. Maybe just in a different way. I wanna to speak to someone here today. I don't know who this is. You know who you are. You don't realize it, but your marriage, the issue with your kids, your lack of peace, your anxiety, the number one issue is you cannot be content with what you have and where you are. That's the issue. You have what's called destination addiction. Destination addiction is the idea that happiness is in the next upgrade, the next raise, or even the next partner. Until you give up the idea that happiness is somewhere else, it will never be where you are. Can I say that last line for somebody? Until you give up the idea that happiness is somewhere else, you'll never be happy right where you are right now. Jean Beauregard, who's a sociologist, said this. This is maybe one of the most convicting quotes I've seen in the last year. He said, atheism hasn't replaced cultural Christianity. Shopping has. We now get our meaning in life from what we consume. And I'm telling you, that's so, that's so convicting for me because I know the high that comes in my own life when the Amazon Prime package shows up. <laughs> what if, in Satan's grand plan, he didn't need to boast atheism, boost atheism way up, he just needed to boost, it our, shop, boost our shopping. What if that's the plan to pull you away from everything God has for your life? And what's beautiful about scripture to me is how much it speaks into this very issue in our life. The word content, the word content in scripture, do you know what the Greek word means? Watch this. For all of us that struggle with our identity, we need a little more. We just don't feel enough. We need a constant pursuit of more. The word content in the New Testament, here's what it means. Enough, sufficient, that you are enough right now without one more thing you purchase, without any upgrade at all, you're enough and you can be content. And unless you embrace that, nothing you buy, nothing you consume will ever make you happy. Dave Ramsey, um, I really hope many of you take Financial Peace University, I think it's amazing. Dave Ramsey said this, 
He said, content people don't always have the best of everything. They make the best of everything. Isn't that good? Contentment isn't a place you get to financially. It is not. What is it? Go back one. Contentment isn't a place you get to financially. It's a place you get, you get to emotionally and spiritually, primarily spiritually, because remember, it's your identity that's the issue. Your identity is the root issue with why you're not content. So what do we need? We need to be reminded of who we are. We need God to remind us of who we are. And if we're struggling with contentment, I think you need to answer this question. Here's the question you need to answer. What are you really trying to buy? No, really. When you are consumed with something, what are you really trying to buy? Because when you're buying things all the time, you're actually trying to buy something to improve your identity and you don't even know it. What are you trying to buy? There's always a false promise behind your purchases. Maybe you're trying to buy image with other people around you. Maybe you're trying to buy being attractive. Maybe you're single and you just think if you had a different wardrobe or something else that maybe you'd be enough finally. Maybe you're trying to buy power or prestige or maybe you're trying to buy away your loneliness. You're so lonely so the little short high of purchasing something always you think is gonna fix it and it never does. What are you trying to buy? I was talking to my daughter about this and she just graduated high school and I said, hey, I want you to think back to a time in high school where you tried to buy something that wasn't about the item, it was really about your identity. I was explaining this concept to her and she said, oh, I know what it is. She said, when I was going into my freshman year of high school, I had an iPhone 5C and I thought to myself, I can't walk into high school with an iPhone 5C. People will think I'm weird. So she worked all summer long just to save up to buy a new iPhone. And she said, what I was really trying to buy was people accepting me. And we look at that example with our kids and we see it. We don't wanna look at the examples in our own hearts and lives. And I hear that and I think, I know there's some of that in me. I'm purchasing things on occasion that are really more about my identity and me not being secure in who I am. So we have to develop some actions that will change our attitude and give us an attitude of contentment. And I wanna suggest just a few. I hope you're taking notes. Here's a few actions you can take that I think really lead to an attitude of contentment. Here's, here's the first one. Number one is you have to undress advertising. Undress it. What do I mean? Behind every advertisement is what? It's actually not just the idea to get you to buy. Behind it all, and if you just watch commercials through this lens, through every advertisement is the idea that you're not enough without this item. Your marriage isn't enough, your kids are not enough, you are not enough. And until you see behind that, you'll fall prey to all the ads and advertising, so undress it. We did something with our kids all growing up, and I think it drove them to, to like nuts, but I'm okay. When we would sit down and watch any video or online or TV and a commercial or ad came on, all the time I'd be sitting next to our kids and I'd go, you see what they're doing? Do you see what they're doing? They're like, what, dad, just let me watch this. Don't get into preacher mode all the time, you know? It's like, and I said, do you see what they're doing? They're trying to trick you. That's the words I use all the time. They're trying to trick you that you need this for you to feel like you're enough. I just wanted to get it in their hearts early. Here's number two. Never impulse buy. Whew. Come on. Anybody else impulse buy? Not emotional thing like, I need this. We, we so t many times impulse buy and later on realize that we didn't actually need it. We have a little buyer's remorse. Again, with our kids, we tried to do something. This was Jamie's idea, not mine. But we came up with this 24-hour rule and we did it with our kids all the time. And they, they hated us for this. But we're not there to make our kids happy. We're here to develop them into Jesus-centered people that can withstand the rigors of this world. When they wanted something, and we were, whether we're in the store or shopping online, even if they had the money, even if they had the money, we made them wait 24 hours before they, they got it. And I'm telling you, they got so mad at us. 
If you've ever been around us or you've been in a store and you've seen one of our kids throwing a fit or looks like irate, I can almost guarantee you it might have been because of this. We told them they had to wait 24 hours and they hated it. And here's what's so interesting to Jamie and I. We, proje- we, we would estimate that 75% of the time when they waited 24 hours, they decided they actually didn't want it. Maybe some of us adults need a little 24 hour rule. <laughs> maybe you'd agree with something with your spouse or someone else of like, hey, maybe we need some time, maybe we need to wait so we don't get wrapped up in the Im- impulse and emotion and let this identity thing mess with us. Here's number three. Before you buy something, ask, what's the true cost? Can I give you an example? We, Jamie and I built a pool years ago and I didn't know the true cost. I don't mean financially, I just mean, wow, this thing breaks all the time. The pump breaks, you know, there's a storm that comes in. I'm out there like, you know, in my pajamas, like scooping stuff out, you know, the basket's always full, the little thing that goes along the bottom, always breaking, always breaking all the time. So what's the true cost of an item? The true cost of an item is always more of your time and energy towards something, and is it really, really worth it? Is it really worth it? Especially, you need to ask this question if something's mechanical or technical, because it takes you time to learn, and it's gonna break, and you're gonna have to maintain it. Maybe, maybe the formula more stuff equals more happiness is just bad math. See, what, what you have to know is that some purchases actually equal less of what matters most. Less time, less financial margin, less peace, less mental real estate, more time that you have to pour into that item versus your marriage, your kids, or relationships. And by the way, parents, I promise you, promise you, promise you, when your kids grow up, they will never, ever say to you, I wish you gave me more stuff. What they could say to you and likely will say to you, is I wish I had more of your time. And isn't it true that many of the things we consume and purchase take more time from the people that we actually love the most? Do you see how dangerous this is? It's an ambush. Plus, some of you really, really wanna be generous. I know you do. But your generosity is hampered because you're always purchasing things for yourself. And it ruins the margin that you would have to be generous towards things God wants you to be generous towards. So here's the the last suggestion I have for you, is that you get in the habit of giving things away. Just get in the habit of constantly giving things away. Jesus said himself, it is more blessed. That means happy. You will be happier when you give than when you receive, when you consume all the time. God didn't design you to be a consumer, but to be a river where his resources flow through you. Get in the habit of giving things away. Jamie and I would tell you personally in our marriage, the greatest spiritual discipline that God has used to transform us is the idea of living a generous life. We would tell you it saved our marriage. That's how big it is for us. Because when we were so consumption-oriented, money dictated our lives. It caused so many arguments and fights, and generosity changed everything for us. These four things, there's more than this, I just think these four things will transform your life. So here's my first challenge to you today. My first challenge is I want you to take these four things, we're gonna create a social square for you on social media that will help you with this, But I want you to take these four things and I want you to put them visibly somewhere in your house or in your life for four weeks. Four things, four weeks. Put it as a screensaver on your phone. Put it in your bathroom mirror. Put it on the kitchen table. Put it on the refrigerator. Because I believe if you'll start doing these things, you'll start developing an attitude where you'll have more contentment and more life. Here's my second challenge. I wanna challenge you to give away everything in your closet, kitchen, and garage you haven't used in the last year. Ooh, okay. You're like, ah, I see where you're going. I see where you're going. If you haven't used it for a year, what are you doing with it? The reason I want you to do this, and I'm gonna do it too, our family's doing this, is because I want you to see how much you already have that you already have enough for most of us. Unless you're below the poverty line, most of us, all of us have more than enough. So I want you to do this. That would transform you. 
Here's the third thing. I want you to take one week or one month and take a discretionary spending fast. You're like, what does that mean? It just means unless it's food or water or something you have to have, you would say, I'm just gonna take a break from the Amazon monster inside of me, right? It's a monster. Like, you, you ever find yourself late at night just like, I'll just think I'll get on and like, scroll. yeah. I want you to take one week at a minimum. For some of you that are brave, you'll do it for one month. But I want you to just take a spending fast so you can see how much the thing is inside of you and that you really are enough. You don't have to buy another thing and buy into consumerism to have happiness in this life. You don't need it. Now, those are my three challenges for you, okay? Here's what I'm gonna say. You have to pick one. If you just pick one, you're a wimp. Is that fair? If you just pick one, you're gonna pick this one. I'll put this up for four weeks, maybe look at it very, you know, a little bit. You're a wimp. If you pick two of these, I think you're starting to win. If you pick all three, and that's what I'm gonna do, if you pick all three, I think you'll start to become a warrior. And we need more warriors in this world that realize that stuff is starting to consume me and I need to learn to be content. So get in the ring, fight for contentment, develop the attitude, and you watch and see, it will transform your life. Your only other option is to go about acting like nothing's wrong and eventually one day, you'll find yourself ambushed and destroyed. And I don't want that for you and you don't want that for you, but remember, Contentment is not a place you find yourself in the future. It's an attitude. It's an attitude that you embrace today. Embrace the attitude. You gotta put these actions into place. Let me pray for you. Father, um, I, wanna, I wanna just pray for myself first and just say, man, I just know, you know how convicting this was to even write this message for me because this thing is in all of us. All of us have this idea of wanting more ishness. And we've bought into the lie that our identity is more in what we have and what we can consume and our purchasing power and our prestige than really finding our identity in you. And so God, we've gotta start developing some actions that, that help us have an attitude of contentment. And I just pray for this next week, for those that are brave enough, brave enough, man enough, woman enough to actually take on these challenges, would you do a mighty work in our lives so we can fight, fight, fight this war against discontentment and learn to be content, to find our value in you, not in the things of this world. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. And all of us said, amen, amen. CCV, I love you, have a great week.